Caro Presidente, Dear President, Dear Prime Minister, you have arrived at the May Saint for friendship among the peoples and you have been welcomed with the warmest welcome ever. We are particularly grateful and honored for these extremely precious encounter, especially considering the topic Italy and the world challenge. And this topic fits perfectly in that universal approach that has always characterized the mating experience. And this is an approach that was taught to us by Don Giussani. In the mid-60s, he used to invite the young boys and girls already to live with the world attitude. And he said so to the guys who were about to leave for Brazil. So we were born with the awareness that our horizon is the world. And so this mating as well tries to keep an eye on what is happening in the world. So we have enlarged our horizon. And when some of us 36 years ago thought about a mating for friendship amongst the peoples, well, certainly, I mean, the violence, drama, violence, persecutions and domination did not have uh, the features that unfortunately we see today on newspapers and uh, every, in many places of the world. Today, even the peace and human rights that were the topic of the very first edition of the meeting are not uh, given, are not to be taken for granted. Unfortunately and regrettably, we need to ask ourselves, uh, as uh, Pope Francis said in his most uh, recent encyclical uh, communication, which kind of world do we want to give to the future generations? So what's our mission here on Earth? So we need to understand that our own dignity is at stake. These are the final words of Pope Francis. So we can do nothing but question ourselves about the real possibility of friendship amongst the peoples. And so this is a message we will never stop repeating. And again, we need to focus on something more radical than tolerance, something going beyond dialogue. This means that we need to deeply believe in the real friendship amongst different men and women. We need to believe that firmly because of the need we have of each other. And we really need to understand that tolerance is not enough. We need to understand that the others are a precious uh, good to us. So it's about understanding and acknowledging the good that we can get from getting to know the others. We need to see that the others, as Caron, Don Caron said in an interview with Republica, that the gaze given on the other is part of ourselves. So over the years, we have seen, as we did this week, that this friendship is possible. Christians, Jews, Muslim, Buddhists, lay people with different backgrounds and coming from different walks of life have been able to get here and share, share that quest for truth, justice, freedom. And this is something that characterizes every human being. And I must say that the mating has always invited people favoring and boosting this friendship. And for instance, Lily, protagonist of Tiananmen Square, the Russian 
dissidents, and then the Ministry for Foreign Affairs from Palestine and Israel, and again, protagonists of the 90s in Poland and Lech Walesa, the leader of Solidarność. So again, we have always tried to invite the protagonists boosting this friendship. And today, we are going through dramatic times. There's a growing climate of uncertainty and fear, and that seems to feed some reluctance and everything is seen with mafiance, unfortunately, with mistrust. People think that everything has already been established and that there is nothing new to be expected, but at Fortunately, these uh, meetings editions showed, on the contrary, that change is possible. And again, today, we hope to have a fruitful experience of listening, of uh, exchange, of debate, but also of, uh, I mean, uh, uh, verification somehow after the attacks in Paris, I mean, Don Caron asked himself on the pages of Republica if we still believe in the winning charm of some sort of naive beauty of the Christian faith that we have been given. And this is also the thought-provoking question that was relaunched yesterday afternoon in the meeting with uh, Professor Weiler. But we understand that, I mean, it's not a matter of lying to ourselves. It's not a matter of telling us nice things when then the reality is completely different and dramatic. So it's about uh, trying to recover that beauty, that innocent beauty resulting from the Christian experience, trying to be able to put away any masks and look straight in the eyes the other and trying to share will sort of desires and hopes that are in our arts. And uh, sometimes in times like these ones, topics like freedom, reason, truth, human existence lost, I mean, their real meaning. And uh, so now more than ever, we need to recover and move over that kind of darkening of the thinking that was mentioned by Pope Benedict XVI. And so that brings us back to the old question posed by our poet Leopardi. And uh, who am I? And again, this is a contribution we can make, trying to put this question daily a stake and try again to ask this question ourselves in every kind of aspect of our life, from the job to our relationships, from politics to economy. And again, we have one single battle to find, and we need to recover the soul of man, as a Russian poet of dissidents used to say. We need to double check, I mean, which is the real possibility that we have to make it possible that our own wishes and other people's wishes can really come true. Because as Pope Francis said, we cannot let other people steal our hope. Thank you very much indeed for coming, Prime Minister. Signor Presidente, nel ringrazio. Mr. Prime Minister, I'd like to thank you for being here, and I have uh, four questions to ask you on the role of Italy in uh, the challenges of the world. The first theme is the uh, Italian anomaly, Italy built from the bottom. This summer, I was really stricken by the news of the number of uh, people who died because of uh, drugs, because, uh, well, uh, I verified that this is really a huge problem. In many cases, a drug is available in a, as well, in a discos as well as in the schools. And this has something to do with the title of the meeting, because this is not a lack, it's rather an, an emptiness. And uh, an emptiness that young people are trying to uh, fill uh, with the drugs, uh, with alcohol. So this, the title of the meeting concerns of the uh, situation, the conditions of uh, Italy. Because if you feel uh, something that is missing, that you are 
lacking it means that you are really looking for something so from this point of view the theme of abraham that uh, is uh, the theme of uh, uh, the uh, exhibition by Bucellati and Nato and dealt with yesterday during the session with uh, Father Caron and Professor Weiler. So what can uh, uh, react to this lack? A uh, uh, God that can be present, man that can be true and uh, that can provide hope. So Italy is not just drugs and drinking. When um, people were saying very negative things in the past years, we at the meeting has, have always documented the right years experiences of Italy. Uh, we have uh, people from different uh, um, cultures and religions at uh, the meeting. In, uh, within our society, within, in our families, at the schools, in the universities, in uh, uh, the uh, labor world. There are so many good people that go on building something new that are creative, um, and creativity is uh, typical of uh, in Italians. Uh, the, so this is our Italy built from the bottom, and uh, uh, lately many criticized uh, uh, this uh, uh, bottom-up approach. Uh, President Mattarella, in his message to the meeting, said very clearly that uh, there is a, an individualistic ideal which is an inspiration of modern men that can be uh, completed in its uh, so social inspiration. This is a commitment for all, everyone in a pluralistic view of cultures and religions. That would be ben beneficial for everyone. So my question, uh, Mr. President, is uh, what does it mean for you to support uh, these forces? Can we relaunch uh, the development of our country uh, by investing in the people, in the families, in the intermediate communities? And can education be the first uh, um, building element? That's my question, uh, my first question. Then Europe, two years ago, we organized an exhibition on Europe. We have always been Europeist. In 1985, we used to speak about Europe from the Atlantic to the Urals, because with Professor Weiler and with John Pope II, we worked on the European routes. We wanted to have a common route because we know what happens if we ha don't have common routes. What happens is that Europe um, actually cannot develop uh, instead of thinking about the development growth uh, um, uh, instead of welcoming everyone it becomes uh, a closed entity it becomes uh, a, a mere institution that is very far from uh, the people from the real people so from this point of view we really believe that Italy uh, in spite of what many people say have a has a lot to say because it has its people, it has its uh, uh, presence, it's bot at the bottom because uh, uh, Italy has always struggled for Europe to change. So my second question is the following. What can our contribution be uh, to a uh, bottom-up approach to Europe? Because otherwise no one will be interested in Europe anymore, most of all young people. My third question, my third topic, here again, uh, it is a very original theme, uh, Italy and the Mediterranean. Mediterranean has been a protagonist here at the meeting for years and years. There is a deep dialogue with Muslims, uh, Jewish people uh, from uh, the other shore of uh, the Mediterranean basin. Christians living there as well. Uh, this meeting again has a center that's focused on this uh, uh, theme with the presence, for instance, of the Tunisian minister. And one of the problems of Europe is that uh, uh, Europe has uh, forgotten the Mediterranean. Uh, the president of Algeria a few years ago here at the meeting said, you forgot us. 
Um, well, uh, this is something extremely important that has to do with another important aspect, the development of the South. Fre Frederick II, uh, if we go back in history, uh, transformed the South into the North of the Mediterranean. Maybe it is time to go back to that. So it is time for us to think about our uh, southern region as uh, the cradle of the future leaders of the world because there are the people there are young, because there is a need for development there, a, a development that is free from colonialism. This is what Italy is. The great diversities of the south are a very important uh, element. Then we have the enlargement of the Suez Canal um, after 1492. This is the first time that uh, Italy can still be at the center of the world. Uh, or uh, uh, we can really contribute to the development of the Mediterranean and linking it to our south, the south of Italy. And we can uh, change uh, the theme of the development of these countries into the development of the south of Italy as well in its uniqueness because uh, Italy was uh, the most welcoming country towards the refugees coming from the sea, uh, from the Mediterranean, uh, from uh, this uh, sea. And uh, here we can really have a new, uh, a new change starting in the south uh, as well as in the cooperation, uh, we started with the any of uh, Matei, uh, the um, works in uh, Aswan. And then the fourth theme, that is the contribution of Italy to peace. Here again, uh, we are swimming against the stream because many people are uh, attacking Italy for its foreign policy, which uh, seems to be a middle of the way policy in mediation between uh, Palestine and Israel, Israel, Europe and Russia, and then attention uh, um, or focus on the third world countries. Well, we are really happy that uh, Italy is mainly against war. We are really proud of this. We are proud uh, of the fact that here at the meeting together with uh, the Holy See, we have uh, always been against uh, the war in Iraq. We do not believe that cannons and bombs can build a democracy. We were against uh, the intervention in Libya that brought about only violence and death. Because we believe, as I said, in dialogue. Father Giussani, years ago, said the, um, the deepest cultural struggle is that the real religious man, that is to say the man who recognizes a bigger God, a God of mystery, and um, the man who just sees God as an idol, uh, that is to say, uh, something that uh, uh, we uh, have uh, to um, achieve. So we really uh, decided uh, to have uh, people here uh, that believe in this uh, in this uh, concept, and there are people. They are people coming from the Mediterranean. This um, last year, Father Pizzaballa, and this year, Father Ibrahim showed us how we can uh, build a dialogue without uh, losing our identity, even if you are uh, hit by the bombs. A country, a state can really take this attitude, uh, this approach to peace, cooperation, education, training, by um, notwithstanding the accusations of uh, right and left uh, fundamentalism, but we want to be the dialogue between Europe and Russia, Palestine and Israel. We want the third world to uh, not to be uh, the center of neo-colonialism. So is, this is my last question. What is the contribution that Italy, with its uh, uh, original culture and identity, can uh, give um, in face of the great international uh, challenges uh, to, so that we can avoid uh, this uh, breaking out of the third world war, as uh, Pope Francis and President Mattarella said? Grazie Emilia, grazie. Thank you very much Emilia. And uh, 
Well, uh, the questions asked by Professor Vitadini are more difficult than the titles of the exhibitions of the mating. So I try to do my best to, to answer these questions, uh, trying to share with you some uh, remarks about uh, the most recent events. Uh, when you talk about uh, the accountability of the self, uh, and uh, when uh, the exhibition on Abraham is one of the key events of this year's uh, edition, you certainly recall everybody's responsibility. And uh, I feel this responsibility in, with respect to you. So I try to share my remarks about Vitadini's questions, trying to express uh, my opinion about uh, the great chances Italy has today, being a land of opportunity and not a land of regrets. But I'll start uh, from uh, a very harsh reality, and that means not being positive, not at all. It means just uh, being sort of uh, true to reality. When we think about our strategy with respect to Europe, we need to be honest and frank and tell ourselves that maybe we have lost 20 years of time uh, on that respect. And when it comes to the Mediterranean, well, a great uh, sort of, uh, uh, a great mayor of uh, uh, Florence, Giorgio Lapira, used to talk about the Mediterranean as a common good shared by all the peoples of uh, the Mediterranean, like an extension of uh, Tiberias Lake. And again, uh, so probably we lost sight of the essence of the European debate. But in the meantime, Europe enlarged its borders in terms of number of countries, in terms of powers and responsibilities and functions. But probably, I mean, we lost sight of the core of Europe itself. So we had cross-eyed uh, gazes and approaches. So probably uh, we didn't have uh, the total approach we should have had. And also when it comes to the southern countries, I mean, uh, there has been a wrong attitude, a neglecting attitude. And southern countries have been depicted as a place of uh, uh, hopelessness and desperation. And uh, again, we need to consider the times you're living. We are going through crucial times. Well, it's like having the impression that uh, history is evolving very fast. I must confess that uh, when I visited the White House uh, representing the Italian government, it was the very same week I had seen the film Selma. It, well, that may sound trivial, but over 50 years, the greatest democracy in the world shifted from, the, from a place like Alabama, where a woman could not vote. So in 50 years of time, well, Barack Obama could become the first black president in the history of the United States of America. So, ladies and gentlemen, this is an example of the, th of the fact that things evolve very fast. The very first edition of the meeting happened in the in 1980s. So, and uh, well, friendship was different at the time. Today, friendship for a young boy or girl is something to ask for on Facebook. But today, friendship has changed. But you have been sort of sowing the seeds of friendship for 36 years. And so, to you, friendship is first of all dialogue and exchange. And so, going back to the four questions asked by Professor Vitadini, there is only one single answer. Well, Italy has to face a huge educational issue, a huge cultural issue. So Italy 
has to make choices. It depends on the option taken. Italy needs to recover its space in the world, in Europe, in the Mediterranean. Italy can make it and get out of the crisis, but only if it's going to invest. But if Italy, on the contrary, will dwell on this negative attitude, Italy will lose an opportunity, but more than that, the world will lose another greater opportunity. So this is the argument I would like to develop here today for the next 30 minutes. And I will start from a fact. At first, I did not want to come here. Yes, I did not want to come here. I want to be extremely frank with you, allow me to say, but not for ideological reasons. I really want to be very honest. My predecessors uh, occupying the same positions always decided to come here maybe because they liked to use this place as a showcase because this is also a beautiful place where it is possible to exchange views and specifically some of my predecessors uh, consider this place as a precious political opportunity not to be missed, but also other predecessors from uh, the left-wing coalition uh, always like to come here for more economic-oriented reasons. In particular, I'm thinking about somebody, but well, my predecessors always love to come here, but well, I'm not one of you, so don't worry <laughs> and don't have any concerns. But I want to tell you that I had doubts in the beginning, but then friendship is such a beautiful world. It's something that really fills our hearts. And when it comes to politics, uh, well, what really counts in politics as well is the quality of human relationships and not just having a lot of benefits. So coming here means enriching yourselves by encountering people who are different from you or maybe have other views. So again, I want to be frank. I, at first I had, uh, I had doubts. And uh, I didn't care about the titles and the headlines that I will read tomorrow in the newspapers because to me, this place is a place where so many people have been able to enrich their lives with friendships, with encounters. So this is a place of friendship and encounters. This is what counts the most to me. And if I'm here, it's because of the value of friendship. And I'll try to give an answer to these complex questions. And I'm trying to do so, first of all, by telling you how I came across you in a school in Florence. I was a Boy Scout in my young hood, and so maybe I developed in my uh, younger years about, uh, I mean, uh, some uh, specific ideas. But I remember I had some sort of uh, quarrels with some schoolmates, uh, and again, uh, we decided to fix things uh, with the priest and the principal of the school and uh, the headmaster. So I remember looking for the priest and telling, hey, my schoolmates uh, did one thing, and uh, my schoolmates uh, said, oh, but he, he's a member, he, he joins uh, uh, com communal liberation, and he, he's here in the room, Don Paolo Bargigia. So I want to say hello to him. And so my schoolmate says, oh, be careful, because then uh, maybe the priest is going to invite you on holiday and uh, is going to sort of invite you to a summer camp. Okay, but it doesn't matter. So after four minutes, uh, yes, I was invited to a summer camp uh, trip to Luca. But I resist. Uh, I show to be a firm and decisive guy. But two months after, I was on the coach traveling to Luca, so discussing if the words of the Portuguese uh, a sort of uh, song uh, uh, exactly expressed uh, the meaning I could get from that. But still, 
So there is uh, uh, an aspect in everybody's life that goes beyond, uh, I mean, strictly political aspects. When I think of you, I think of Peggy Claudel Chesterton, of how I talked about Lopardi with my teachers when studying for the A-levels, and how I developed uh, different political ideas. And uh, I'm here happy and grateful. I'm here happy, joyful, and grateful because uh, this is the text uh, of a text message sent to me who unfortunately left us, but he was, uh, I mean, uh, a member of uh, uh, Forza Italia, Graziano Grazzini, who is not with us any longer, unfortunately. He was my opponent when I was younger, and Graziano was a, a tough opponent. We had a lively debate, uh, and uh, when uh, he, he turned uh, 50, I remember that he sent a text message saying, joyful and grateful. I think this is a beautiful expression, and uh, if you were to hear his uh, political words, uh, well, it was not uh, uh, joyful and it was not grateful. He used also to insult me sometime, but it, it doesn't matter. I mean, there was something greater beyond that. Uh, I mean, not uh, simply uh, political distance. Uh, so I want to start from this. Uh, and uh, it's going to be very hard for me to sort of be here and maybe from tomorrow talk about reforms and my uttered words. And I would like to go back to four main points. Again, going back to my friendship with Graziano. Over the last 20 years, in my opinion, Italy was able to turn the Second Republic into a sort of constant political riot that lost sight of the common good. And while the world was evolving at the fastest rate pace ever, as Emilia said, remained sort of entangled in useless discussions. And I know that the people here sometimes uh, had uh, huge rounds of applause for some predecessors. Uh, so the supporters of Berlusconi and also the people not supporting Berlusconi sort of made uh, Italy lost incredible opportunities. And now, in spite of the Second Republic, we have to start run again. Well, it's like considering the reforms that you are proposing that are just a tool would be a sort of a downster, sort of fully merged in the course uh, to make Italy recover. Let's take the European debate. Over the last uh, 20 years, Italy and Europe enlarged to 28 countries. And I'll say something, and maybe somebody uh, won't, uh, won't agree. So, uh, the 28 Europe is either too much or too little. There was no clear political vision behind it, especially from Italy. So there was a sort of a shifting of the borders towards the eastern part of Europe, and the Balkans were cancelled from this debate. Italy decided to sort of stay out of this debate. But you have seen what happened. You have seen the Brenica, and you've seen the Serbian Premier asking for forgiveness for that tragedy. And you've seen what has been happening in Albania over the last 20 years. And uh, the President Birama tells us that uh, when the European Union sort of suspended for six months uh, the sort of uh, entry negotiations for Albania, the fundamentalists in this country said once again, oh, you see, Europe doesn't want us because in Albania, cohabitation is maybe more difficult than uh, uh, somewhere else. So Italy remained entangled in its own thing, so remaining excluded from the big political uh, debate at European level. So Europe has kept on going on without Italy. And as Vizzadini said, that provoked the distancing of young people. I don't know if Vizzadini said uh, young people in Italy today do not care a thing about Europe, but certainly 
Well, Europe is considered as a given. When you're used to Europe, to European travels, European studies, but they do not understand the political dimension of it. Uh, Schumann, Adenauer, De Gasperi, and long before that, Spinelli had a huge uh, vision, a, a political dream, but that turned into something meaningless in Italy. But Italy is responsible for that because it's erased the world politics. But the world politics is beautiful, it's meaningful. I do not accept these words to be so much abused and mistreated because this is uh, something negative, it's something wrong because, well, there are people then miscalculating things, but it doesn't matter because this is a wrong message because then uh, Europe sort of, well, sort of decided to remain excluded from Europe somehow. Europe has been turned into simply a vote basins, a sort of a reservoir for votes. Uh, so, or just uh, an entity telling us, oh, yes, you're doing good, or no, you're doing very bad. And uh, again, this is not good for us. If you take uh, Miriam, the girl who was forced to give birth to her baby in prison and uh, set them free and uh, sort of let her go to the US. Uh, it was the way we started our six months presidency and we told it to the, parla the parliament in Strasbourg and then we went to her bill and we said clearly that after the unjust uh, uh, sort of sleep of Srebrenica, being close to the suffering and pain of that people was a way to say clear out loud that Italy is not just spread and uh, austerity and the deficit, it's, uh, Europe is also something else. That's why with respect to immigration, we will never accept a message. It wants to make Italy like a land of fear. The policy of fear wants to win over us, where we can lose votes, but first and foremost, we need to save human lives. We need to give hope and future to these people. This is not just being good or politically correct. These are centuries of civilization, and I want to sort of deny that just for a bunch of votes. And those who want to follow the policy of fear, they can do it. Europe is different. It's not a mere patchwork of figures. From this point of view, the real issue is different. So the real question is the following. So can Italy really play an important role in this ever-changing Europe? Well, yes, provided it's sort of open to change. I'll try to be extremely short. The set of reforms uh, we would like to implement from the Jobs Act uh, to other important institutional reforms, uh, from the election law down to the reorganization of uh, the civil service and the public administration. Well, our plan is to make this country start again. We lost so much time, but reforms won't be enough. They won't be enough to give this country an identity back. This is a basic requirement. So I go abroad and when I say, okay, we have reformed the election law, and they ask me, and so what? And say, okay, those who are going to get the most votes are going to manage and govern the country. And they say, Oh, really? I mean, it wasn't like that already. Oh, <laughs> no, it wasn't. Well, you understand, the Thailand system was not considering mechanism this kind, so it was not a given that those who run for elections, then if they get the most votes, will run the country. But our law is the very first piece in this huge patchwork, in this huge puzzle, just to say one very simple thing. When a person starts uh, governing this country, the very first task is not protecting himself or herself from the attacks of their uh, his own party or uh, the uh, opponent's party, but it's about caring for the common good. So you will have a list of candidates, you will vote for your favorite candidates, so if they win, they will govern, if they want, they will have to get organized to win the elections the next time. But in the meantime, 
the politicians have to collaborate for the common good. It's not about trying to destroy what is being done by somebody else. This is the key difference. This is what we want to do with the reforms. You can vote anybody else. You name it, you can vote the people you want and you're free to do so, of course. But together, all together, we are free and we have to admit and acknowledge one very simple thing. Italy needs simple rules. When Vizzadini, Professor Vizzadini, you tell us that the history of this country was made by small and uh, large stories, small and big experiences. Well, this is a, this is a truth. But what has the state been doing over these years? Uh, until the 90s, Italy allowed, uh, I mean, uh, any kind of venture with loads of contradictions, doubts, inconsistencies, and so on and so forth. Okay. But during the Second Republic, I mean, a sort of vicious circle, a catch-22 sort of uh, installed itself. So rules were approved, and these rules did not prevent a sort of uh, uh, people acting illegally to do it, and so on and so forth. But then, at the same time, we had rules that uh, are not easy to be changed. But if I want to, to, to implement these reforms, but it's because I want to change things. It's not because I want to reduce taxes to, to be more popular, but reducing taxes means increasing the level of freedom of a country and not increasing the popularity of a prime minister. We want to increase social justice. So 80 euros in 2014 and the labor cost in 2015, uh, tax reduction over the next uh, three years. These are not overnight inventions. This is not just about a magic trick to blur your mind and mesmerize you. No, it's just a way to so try to acknowledge, I mean, the need of Italians for freedom and reducing taxes is all it's the only way to be really equal in the today's society. But to do so, we need to sort of make life in our country easier. Everything should become easier in this country. It's like the David by uh, Michelangelo. Well, Luzzi uh, was from Florence, and so there's a sort of, uh, I mean, Florentine influence. And so when uh, Michelangelo, I mean, were, was asked uh, how could you make this beautiful masterpiece, he said, well, I just got rid of what was, uh, I mean, uh, not useful. Again, we need to do the same when it comes to the rules in the labor market. Would you ever believe one or two years ago that we would have made so many changes with the job sacks? Well, that's exactly what we need uh, to do. We need to keep doing that. We just need to tell the world that our history, our will is much stronger than the buzz that we hear every day. This is a country made of people that take risks, put themselves at stake, and we need to start again even faster and better than before again. But so far we were blocked, we were paralyzed. We were put on a standby status because people thought it was necessary. Everybody was afraid of doing, but now we need to unblock ourselves because people today are blocked. We need to unblock people, unblock their possibilities. Anybody who wants to do anything, they need to have the opportunity to do so. Again, we're going to have key reforms of the next few months. We need to tell this country, set Italy free. Let's create the conditions to let this country restart. And because if Italy then can really go back to the place it deserves. So we have like a polar star, the United States is our guiding light. I do not think that Italy on the international exchequer 
can be sort of equally distant from everything. But certainly, we have a privileged relationship with the United States. But at the same time, we can show that we are fully independent. We have our own voice. When the uh, sort of Italian presidency of the European Union started, I said out loud in Strasbourg that, uh, well, uh, Italy, I mean, uh, considers that Israel has the duty to exist, not just the right, because of its history, of its people. I say it clearly out loud. And also, we are the first country for cooperation and support in the system in Palestine. And again, and I didn't get applauses for these remarks and uh, uttering. And again, when we think about constructing Europe against Russia and is, uh, in some European countries who have just joined us think that, this is a tragic mistake. This this is a tragic mistake. I would also like to be very clear on that. It's not an economic factor. Znaidero from Federlenio is here and probably he will just uh, jump on its say This is not an economic factor. The main issue for Russia now is not the sanctions because uh, sort of oil barrel at $40, that's the real issue. I mean, uh, it's a cultural fact. It's not just an economic factor. Europe uh, cannot be built, uh, I mean, simply on an opposition. And certainly the similarities that unite us are greater than the differences uh, sort of making us different. And we are part of an alliance. We were the first to go to Egypt. We were the first to go there and we acknowledge the efforts of President al -Sizi, a meaningful effort, an important effort. And again, this is important to sort of uh, regain the importance of the Mediterranean. I uh, first went to Tunis and not to Germany or else, uh, anywhere else. And this is a question that I want to ask you and to you, Professor Vitadini, and to you all. How is it possible that over the last few months, the symbolic places of the terrorist attacks uh, were cultural places, uh, either religious places or educational key places, I'm just going to make a short list. Peshawar, an international school, the Bardic Museum in Tunisia, Charlie Hebdo in Paris, the synagogue in Brussels, the Jewish Museum in Copenhagen, and so many churches that are burnt in Africa. This is a real persecution against our Christian brothers and sisters on that continent. What is happening? Terrorism is trying to kill us the way they like, but they do not succeed. So they want us death, but since they cannot kill us, they want us to live as they like, in terror, in the fear of uh, our enemies and this is a devastating dramatic uh, approach to culture because they are trying to close us up to build walls around us a wall is something that you build because you think it can protect you but in the end you are trapped in so this is the educational and uh, cultural response this is what Italy is called upon to do. In front of its enormous beauty, the beauty of our works of art, of our uh, quality of life, of our dialogue, of our well-being and welfare and uh, wealth, our way to live together in friendship as an encounter of different people with different stories. So when these choices are in a way an antidote, are in a way a barrier against the violence of uh, extremism and fundamentalism. This is the right way to outline the future of Italy. This is why it is uh, so important for us uh, to uh, remember who we are. 
we are not only a country that uh, fears globalization. Over the last 20 years, uh, they wanted us to believe that we needed to fear globalization first. So fe we should have uh, feared the United States, then we should have feared the China. I'm the first prime minister after 63 that I went uh, to Africa in the south of the Mediterranean. We had abandoned that area completely, whereas Africa is uh, the most uh, obvious place to go to because we are the bridge between Europe and Africa. Why? Because everyone told us you, need, you must fear globalization. Globalization is our nightmare. Globalization is our problem. Globalization is our biggest asset in Italy because in the future, this uh, world changing so fast asks for beauty. I don't want to make an existential comment, but that uh, question by Mario Luzzi is a question that uh, concerns not only Italians and Europeans. There is this need, this lack for something else from something higher in the world, apart from uh, religious and philosophical creeds. That's what Italy is. Italy is a place that gives extraordinary answers because uh, like magic, uh, Italy has always produced quality and beauty, and we still do this. Those who say that Italy is only a list of problems should look at the real everyday experience of people living around us. There are fascinating stories of a country that still goes on in spite, notwithstanding politics sometimes. These are the people that go on believing in the beauty of our country. That's why I believe that this world, with all its uh, debates and, and confrontations, uh, its polemics, uh, its difficulties, uh, it's a world that asks for Italy to be there. And then, my fourth point, Italy needs to move. Well, I spent a beautiful, beautiful summer at home after a year where I, well, actually traveled quite a lot. So it, I really enjoyed staying at home for a while. But, well, like every summer, there is, uh, well, this, uh, this kind of challenge. Uh, who says uh, the uh, most interesting or uh, funny things? Uh, well, uh, a distinguished political uh, character said, our economic proposal is uh, to block Italy for three days in November. They have been blocking us for uh, 20 years. Now we have to do exactly the, co the opposite. We need to make Italy move, not block Italy, not stop Italy. After 20 years, when Italy was uh, imprisoned by prohibitions uh, and vetoes, now, now we have the room, the chance to build a uh, public administration that can give you right answers, a yes or a no, in a short time. A system where we can have a real uh, reform of institutions so that will enable regions to do what they have to do and not something else, while at the same time we could have um, less politicians and more politics. Somebody say that if there is no direct election of uh, our senators, then the democracy is at risk. Well, democracy is not uh, measured uh, according to the number of elections. So, well, uh, if you want to have a system that works, you need uh, that voters then will uh, find uh, uh, political decision makers that do what they promise to do. It's not that if you have more politicians, you have more democracy. You just uh, make politicians more, uh, well, happier. Well, this is really something ironic. 
But to do this, to achieve this goal, we need to go back to the positivity of what is real. We need to acknowledge that Italy was not made by those who govern Italy. Italy is built every day by thousands and hundreds of thousands of people who do their own work, their own job. The uh, task of the government today is not to build up uh, an organized system to regulate these people. No, we have to leave these people, to, to leave them free to do, to let them do what they have always done. Beautiful things that, uh, are, uh, that are stunning for the whole world. And I would like to conclude uh, to well, uh, share with you the, the the emotion that I, I felt when I visited the exhibition of uh, the cathedral in Florence and uh, well if you have time go there it's beautiful the um, cathedral of Florence it's is, is full of Contradictions, well, that's that's part of the history of the, the people of uh, Florence. When the Guelph and Ghibellines uh, uh, stopped uh, fighting uh, the former one, uh, decided uh, to divide themselves again. So we had the white Guelphs and the black Guelphs. They couldn't just stop fighting. That just, they just couldn't. So, well, we have always loved a good fight. And uh, we have... Uh, um, we had uh, two different associations uh, uh, fighting uh, because uh, they wanted uh, to decide over uh, a few things in uh, the uh, cathedral square. So this is very typical of us. We are always quarreling. So uh, at the same time, uh, this is a place that is global in its universal message of beauty. And as a mayor, the most difficult thing I did, and I must say this is really something I'm proud of, is that I decided, I took the decision to turn the Cathedral Square into a pedestrian area because uh, this doesn't uh, take anything away from uh, the beauty of Brunelleschi's dome. It doesn't take anything and it doesn't add anything to the beautiful uh, church of St. John or the extraordinary beauty of uh, uh, the, uh, the uh, works of art you can see in the exhibition. But this was a challenge that we had uh, met um, almost in secret with a group of friends studying all uh, the city maps uh, in the summer and uh, that we announced uh, uh, at the very last moment. Uh, otherwise, uh, the people in Florence would have protested and uh, some uh, uh, shop owners realized what was happening just a few days before uh, the pedestrian area was uh, created. Anyway, why did we do this? Because I believe, uh, just as I, uh, so many of you, that that line by Chesterton who, sa who said, the world will never finish for the lack of beauties, but for the lack of uh, um, wonder. Our country is a place where we have get used to uh, these wonders, this beauty. We are now uh, um, used to beauty. That act, the creation of the pedestrian area, was a way to say, when you're walking through the square, look up. Look at what is surrounding you. So we don't need to turn the whole country into a pedestrian area, but we really need to uh, remind each of us of our responsibilities. We need to acknowledge that if we want to save our country, we need to be aware of the extraordinary um, strength that Italy has. We need to uh, continue uh, to continue to feel this wonder, this uh, uh, feeling of uh, doing something. So we do not have to stop and uh, debate every single uh, rule and reform. No, what we need to do is to acknowledge what is happening in our country and that Italy has an enormous uh, space, an enormous uh, margin uh, on which she can grow. Everything we uh, can, uh, we need to become a big, great country is still there. Thank you.
Concludiamo. So let's finish this meeting by thanking Prime Minister Renzi. Well, we started saying that we were expecting this meeting as a good hearing, listening opportunity, and also a good opportunity to make a check. And I think that we positively acknowledge that uh, when faced with institutions that are trying to get this country out of the crisis and that try to sort of uh, work for the common good, we are there. We are there to collaborate, to give our contribution, to do our task, to do what we can. We are a down-to-earth reality that is able to operate within the country. And so when it comes to going beyond uh, the logic of fear, when it is about moving over clashes and riots and quarreling, well, again, we are there to support positive approaches for the country. And I think that today's meeting is a proof of this will and uh, uh, sort of mentality. Thank you very much.